I'm Chris. How you doing, Grant? Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me here. We're at the USS Constitution, and I understand you're active Navy, but you don't seem like you're dressed like it. Yeah, absolutely. We are active duty Navy. So I said I'm Grant, but Navy me is mass communication specialist, second class, Grant Grady. I've been in the Navy for seven years, and I'm stationed here. And like you said, what am I wearing? Well, when I came to work today, before I met you, I was wearing my camouflage, the Navy working uniform, what people are familiar with. And you know, yesterday I was wearing my dress whites, the Cracker Jacks, that kind of get up. But today I'm in the 1813, 1812 era uniform because Constitution, that's where she made her name. This is what they would have worn back in the day. And that's gonna help us connect to the story of the USS Constitution, also known as Old Ironsides. How does it get that name? So it's pretty simple. It's made of iron, right? No. I would assume. No, it's not made of no. iron, but the story is an amazing story. So we're on the Freedom Trail today. We're at one end of the Freedom Trail and you make your way across to the north end of Boston. You get more revolutionary history. Here, we're all about the War of 1812 and that's where we got our nickname. Our Captain Isaac Hall and his crew were going up to meet five American ships to join up and then take orders from there and you know start the war, do their mission. They spot five distinct warships and you know in 1812 when there's five distinct warships where you're supposed to meet five distinct warships you think it's who it is you sure. think it's your friend and eventually we realize they're flying the royal navy ensign they're a british ship they're who we're fighting and it's five verse one so what are you going to do five verse one it's not cowardly you're going to run and he comes up to boston and he thinks that he's a coward even though he made the right decision it's hard being a captain sometimes you got to do um you know you got to run you got to retreat ship you gotta protect your ship. They're no good if everyone's lost, right? But he says, no, I'm gonna resupply. I'm gonna defy the Secretary of War and we're gonna go out and we're gonna go find us a British ship. He finds a British ship, the HMS Guerriere. And what's very interesting is HMS Guerriere was one of those five British ships that chased him and made him feel he was a coward. So the revenge is there. And as we get in range of Guerriere, they start firing their, their guns at us, so their cannons. And eventually, splash, 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 and they start hitting the ship. He has a sailor climb over the side of the rigging and just watch what's happening. And the sailor witnesses clunk and cannonball bounces right in the water. And in 1812, that would have been like a miracle. And he just, in disbelief, goes, huzzah, her sides are made of iron. And Isaac Hall replies, iron sides, I. And that's where the nickname, old iron sides, because we're a little older than we were back then. That's where the nickname comes from and Isaac Hall returns a hero, not committing treason against the Secretary of War, a hero with a prize crew, and he becomes super famous, especially in our history, for giving us the nickname Old Ironsides. Vindication. So we have a lot we can explore here over our visit. Let's go take a look. Absolutely, let's go. As we're walking on to the ship, I'm just amazed at the engineering that's involved with making all this happen. You see the hull, which is the side of the ship right here, right there. That actually has a great design to it. So I like to think of an Oreo cookie. You know, you have the cookie layers and you have the cream, right? So the hull is actually in three layers. So the two outside layers, the cookie layers, they're made of white oak, which was standard um, shipbuilding construction wood at the time, found across New England, found across, you know, the United States, the, the original colonies at the time. The middle, the cream layer, you're gonna have a little bit thicker wood in size, but it's also five times denser, and that's called live oak. And what made this live oak unique was it was from St. Simons, Georgia. So the British, the French couldn't get their hands on it. And that five times density um, makes the ship old iron sides or iron sides. Now, uh, what part of the ship are we on here before we move to the next part? So we are at the aft end of the ship and right here is called the taff rail. So this is the back end of the ship. And what comes back here is we have a sail above us called the spanker. It's a very big air rudder that goes about almost 100 feet in the air, and that's kind of how you use the air to turn, as well as the rudder itself. And then also back here, you're gonna have these holes right here, or these gun ports, and that's actually where we'd have bow chasers. So we have three types of guns we would have had on board. We have our 32 pound carronades, our 24 pound long guns, the big 6,500 pound ones. And back here we'd have 
18 pound bow chasers. And what they were doing was chasing the bow of the ship. So this is stern, which is the back. And then we're gonna be chasing their bow. So if a ship's chasing us, we have two back here, not to really sink them, but to say, hey, stop chasing us. So we're gonna put them on the back, aim it at them and shoot it at them. Very good. Take us around the rest of the deck and let's see what we have to, to check out. Yeah, absolutely. So I just talked about them. We have the carronades right here. And this is a great example of a carronade right here. So the carronades, while a lot smaller on the 24 pound long guns, they actually pack a bigger punch. So they only, only weigh 2,200 pounds, <laughs> still quite heavy. And it take about four to eight men to man. The concept of four to eight, that seems like a big difference. It's double is because you're responsible for the left report and the, or the right and starboard side of the gun. So there's one here, there's one over there. If unfortunately a ship pulls up on both sides, you can split and have four and four and still be able to conduct your, your gun team and fight the battle. So four to eight's the number that you would have in one team. Do you need eight people using this thing? Absolutely not. And when you look at it, you'll see the long guns we've, when you're downstairs have wedges in them. This one actually has a screw system and this is actually how they would aim it. So you turn this and it's gonna raise the gun up and down and you don't aim horizontally. You don't aim guns horizontally. The ship's going to get you in position. You aim vertically for distance. And the distance for these guys would be about 400 yards. These are where you make your money and you're going to put in all kinds of fancy rounds that you're going to aim at all the rigging and all the sails to actually immobilize your enemy. And hopefully we can get our Marines and sailors to board the enemy ship and make it a, you know, the HMS ship and USS ship. If we shred the sails, they can't go anywhere. Absolutely not. So they're not trying to sink the enemy ship. No, not necessarily, especially American ships. So that Typical cannonball, that round shot everyone talks about. You see it in the movies all the time. That's what's designed to pierce through the side of the ship and sink it. But that's actually not the goal. That's kind of more of a last resort um, in the age of sail. You want to procure the enemy ship, take their goods and take the ship and use it for yourself. <laughs> now you talked upstairs about some of the guns, but now we're on literally what's called the gun deck. And these look a lot different. They are totally a lot different. So the gun deck, USS Constitution, is a 44 gun frigate. But she actually has more. So she would actually carry anywhere from 50 to 60 because the more guns you can bring, the better, right? So we saw the carronades up top a little smaller, and then you look at these long guns right here, they're long guns, they're a lot bigger, and they do a different thing. 2,200 pounds up top, down here, 6,500 pounds gun and carriage. We're also gonna talk about how far they fire versus upstairs. 400 yards, 1,200 yards down here. So these have quite a range. And then they're gonna take that seven to 14 men. Same concept as the carronades with the four to eight. Seven is the minimum, and you're responsible for port left, starboard right. And that's what you're going to do if an enemy pulls up on both sides. You're going to split in seven and you're going to operate one of these things. And over here, I'll bring it out, is a big wooden pointer. Check this thing out. So that's called a pointer. And what you're going to do is you're going to leverage that underneath the gun from an angle like over here. And you're going to lift the gun up. Right now, it's just you. But you would have another shipmate over there helping you out. So there's going to be two. And as you lift the gun up and hold it, the gun captain's gonna take this wedge called a coin and he's gonna vertically aim the gun for distance. So you're holding it up, I'm pushing it back and forth and we're gonna aim it higher or lower for distance. Once the gun is aimed and your pointers are done, we are ready to go. So we take our matchstick and the next command is going to be stand by. Stand very far away, that's why the matchstick is this big and boom, gun's gonna go, so boom but it's gonna kick back six to nine feet. So right now your foot gone. is gone. Oh. It's gonna kick back six to nine feet. And this line that's wrapped around it is actually what's stopping it from going through the entire end of the other ship. Oh, yeah. And that all took 90 seconds to do it. They were quicker than I just explained it. That's really impressive. Yeah. And what's even more impressive is the British were about two minutes on average and the French were three minutes on average. So we had a better um, gun team on average in the United States Navy and that's because we practice, we practice, we practice, and we live fire. So with that sort of firing advantage, that becomes huge when you multiply it by mm -hmm. 44 or 50 guns. Ab absolutely, but you can't fire them all at once. If you look down, you see this big row of guns, and you have guns above us as well. 
So if you fire all these at once, you're gonna flip the ship on its yeah. side. So that's that, a lot of force. That's actually. a lot of force, 6,500 pounds flying back. So what you're gonna do is conduct a rolling broadside. A broadside is firing all your guns on one side. A rolling broadside is firing them in a line, like dominoes. Boom, 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 boom. the ship's moving, you're kind of aiming all at the same points. So you're going to make sure you hit your mark. Because while well, these were powerful, they were not the most accurate. <laughs> That's just the truth at the time. There's no rifling or anything like that. So I notice we're Underneath the hatch? Mm -hmm. Go underneath the main hatch to get some light in here, get a little bit of airflow. But that's actually not what this is for. This is for, well, one, there's battle, there's guns around us, but there's not just fighting aboard ships. You know, there's lifestyle. You're fighting the ship as much as you're fighting the enemy. So if you look around, you're going to see a bunch of tubs and different things, and they'll have uses. So this right here, this is the scuttlebutt. So that's a term that we still use in today's Navy. Yeah. It's known as the water fountain today. But this is the original scuttlebutt. So if you look at it, a scuttle is this square opening right here. And a butt refers to the barrel. So a butt load is actually a barrel load. So you get the term scuttlebutt. And this is where they get their fresh water. About 40,000 gallons of water we brought on board, which is a four month supply. And each sailor would get about a gallon a day. Ooh. Gallon a day to drink and bathe. That's it. So if you're climbing up the rigging, you're moving heavy guns, you're doing a bunch of labor, are you gonna drink your water or are you gonna bathe with your water? Yeah. Drink you it. Do? You're gonna drink it? And you go downstairs, you see downstairs, think of the smell down there with oh. 500 other crew members, because that's how big the crew size was. So 500 people needed 40,000 gallons of water for four months. This area right here is where the food would happen. So, Right here is the steep tub. So if you want to take a peek in, just a little opening right there, and this is where they'd actually soak their meat. So they'd get different kinds of food. They'd get bread, they'd get cheese, but they'd have different rations of pork, beef, sometimes goat or chicken. And again, we just talked about no refrigeration. So they'd actually keep livestock right behind us, and that was the animal pen back behind us. That's what they had livestock. Live animals, Live animals on would be ship. on board. Get them through the main hatch. Just lower them down. So when you butcher them, you either got to eat it right away or you got to preserve it. So this tub called the steep tub comes into the preservation. You put the meat in and I hope you like salt because for every one pound of meat, you're putting two pounds of salt in. And you're filling this up with some of that water all the way up and you're going to change the water out every six, four to six hours throughout a 24 hour cycle. So four to six times in a day. And when you open it up, take the meat out, empty the water, you're gonna have this nice crystallized cured meat. Some people call it beef jerky, but it's not beef jerky. It's cured, it's salty, you're gonna crust it off and you can store it downstairs. Or if you want, you can throw it in the oven right here, which we call a camboose. So the camboose is an oven. A lot of people think it's a furnace or a stove, but it does two things. It's where they cook the meal. So this is where they cook the beef and they'd get three meals a day. So breakfast would either be typically maybe some cheese or a ship's biscuit, which is just water and yeast baked a couple times on land and then one more time on shore or on the ship itself. And if you think old Ironsides is strong, the ship's biscuit, you can smash it against the hull and the hull might, I might be the only thing that can break the hull. They are very, very hard. So they usually pocket their breakfast and wait till lunch, which would have been their one hot meal they got out of the three. And it would be a stew with this beef, hot stew, so they could dunk their ship's biscuit in there. And now you have a nice soft biscuit, soft, and they could eat it. And then dinner, would just be leftover lunch. So cold, cold lunch was now dinner. And that was the three square meals a day. Doesn't sound great, probably didn't taste the best, but by living standards back then, three meals a day meant a lot to a lot of people. And that's why a lot of people volunteered to join the Navy. Now we've talked about eating and drinking. What about sleeping? Sleeping. So what they would do is they would take the, cam the food from the camboose downstairs and they would eat in their gun teams along the white structures downstairs that line the sides of the ship called knees. So they'd take the food, go down there and eat. 
When they're done eating, they'd come back up, dump it off, and after dinner, it was time for bed. And they'd also sleep, typically in their gun teams, with hammocks about 18 inches apart all across the deck below us called the berth deck. Our thanks to the crew of the USS Constitution for hosting us. It was a once in a lifetime experience. How many people can say they fired a cannon on the deck of one of the most famous ships in the world? <laughs>